the Leica Apo Summicron M 90mm f2 spherical. Originally released in 1998, I feel that it bridges the classic era of Leica's cameras and lenses with their more modern ideals and philosophies. Philosophies that are often in the pursuit of perfection, but does it come at the cost of compromising what made these cameras so unique and popular to begin with? Or was the 90mm Summicron spherical well ahead of its time and continues to be a great lens for the modern Leica photographer? I'm David, and this is the whole picture. For context, when it comes to Leicas, I mainly use film M cameras with a focus on street and travel photography. I picked up the 90mm Apo for the most part as a complement to my 35mm Summicron spherical, and since I've used it on a variety of cameras from specialized high magnification rangefinders like the M3, M6J, and Voigtlander's Bessa R3 series, to the more standard M5, M42, and a regular M6. I've even used it quite a bit on this 0.5 magnification MP, but mostly with a magnifier for the viewfinder. And when it comes to digital, I use the 90mm Apo on the M9, as well as an A7S, for more than just travel and street photography, and I have a variety of sample photos to show you today. I also wanted to note that while I will be covering some technical elements in this review, I don't typically do highly scientific tests, and so my reviews are more based on my preferences as well as experience using the equipment. So, with that out of the way, and especially with Leica lenses being famous for their cloth slitting image quality to begin with, what's so special about these Apo spherical lenses? Very basically, a spherical lenses can help in correcting spherical aberrations, and apochromatic designs help accurately focus the red, green, and blue light to the same plane, resulting in reduced chromatic aberrations. Lenses with spherical elements are pretty common these days, including almost the entire modern lineup of Leica M lenses. But unlike a spherical lenses, apochromatic correction doesn't necessarily have a defined standard, so designs and effectiveness will vary from company to company. Leica's implementation is very impressive, as it seems to not only cut down on chromatic aberrations in the areas of sharp focus, but also the elements of a photo that are out of focus. So, apochromatic correction paired with spherical elements, in theory, go hand in hand to help create a better, possibly more true-to-life image. But it can also be very technical. What does it actually look like in practice? I did a quick comparison between the Apo 90 and the 90mm Elmar Macro, with both lenses set to f4, and I think it shows the benefits you could expect with an apochromatic design. With the M2 that I'm holding being very high contrast, many lenses like the 90mm Macro Elmar will exhibit color fringing. But if we take a closer look at the photo taken with the 90 Apo, this kind of color fringing is significantly reduced or not present at all. That being said, when using the 90 Apo wide open, you can still see color fringing, especially in high contrast scenes, but stopping down to f4 or 5.6 does tend to clean things up, and the resulting image quality is excellent, and I'd say under ideal circumstances, it's a very true to life image. And this is what initially struck me about this lens and compelled me to pick one up. I felt that the image it produces were often very close to what I actually saw in real life, and for street photography and travel photography, that could be a big selling point. Bokeh is also, for the most part, smooth and circular, wide open, it isn't uncommon to see cat's eye or busy corners, but they do clean up nicely as you stop down. I was surprised that despite the 11 blade aperture and the compression that you can get with a 90mm lens, it was very rare to get bokeh with sharp or defined sides, and even if you do, it's probably not going to be the most noticeable at a normal viewing distance. The 90mm focal length isn't necessarily the first thing that comes to mind when you think rangefinders, travel, and street photography. So admittedly, it is a bit of a specialized lens for me, and I don't use it every day, but when I do, I found that the compression as well as image quality can produce some very striking images for travel photos. And especially in busy cities, I think it could help you cut through the noise and give you more soft poetic street photos compared to the more busy or confrontational photos you can get with wider angle lenses in street photography. But I also found that there were many times when this lens couldn't capture, say, valuable context because of that tighter angle of view. At the same time, switching to another lens could cost you the shot, so I often found myself carrying two cameras in an attempt to make this lens more practical. And while a 2 like a setup might break the bank, I don't think that they should break your back. But unlike other kits, I found the 90mm Apo makes just about any M camera I use it on extremely front heavy. Just even holding it here for a few minutes, I can start to feel the strain on my wrist. And the longer length of the lens just made using two cameras at the same time feel unpractical. So I found myself leaving this secondary setup in my bag and only bringing it out for scenes that made sense with a 90. I guess I would consider this a more practical approach. After all, in a bag, the size and weight aren't going to be as noticeable as the same equivalents on a different camera system. 
but even then, needing to reach into your bag could cost you the shot, and the whole thing started to feel like I was searching for a valid question to an answer I had found. Beyond that, something else I had to be mindful of when using this lens was flare. I found that even when using the hood, I could see a loss in contrast in certain areas of the photo, or even capture visible flare, when I didn't expect it to. To me, it's not a deal breaker necessarily, and if you're mindful about your light sources, it shouldn't be an issue. But for street, where you can't really control the light sources, especially on film where you can't double check your photo before moving on, it can lead to some disappointment. And on the topic of the hood, I didn't really find much difference in the finder blockage whether I was using it or not. It is a long lens to begin with, and it does start to creep into the frame lines a little bit, but for my photography, it never really seemed to be an issue. Actually, I really appreciate the design of this built-in hood. I think it's equal parts elegant and functional. And if I'm not mistaken, the 90mm Apo was one of the first Leica lenses with this kind of design, so it's another reason I feel it bridges the old and new eras of Leica, as many lenses that followed, including many of the Apo lenses, have adopted this built-in hood design. Unlike many Leica lenses though, the 90 Apo doesn't feature a traditional filter ring with the make and model listed on it, rather that information is displayed around the hood. There are only a handful of Leica lenses with this kind of design, the 135mm Apo f3.4, also from 1998, as well as the 21mm and 28mm Summilux lenses. All of these lenses have a large front element, so I assume this was a way to keep the size as compact as possible. That being said, I still find the 90mm Apo to be quite large for a rangefinder lens, and it ends up with a 55mm filter thread, compared to the 39mm we traditionally see on many classic Leica lenses, especially the Semicron line. So if you have a lot of these lenses and you like to use filters, the 90 Apo might be a little bit more difficult to integrate into your kit or workflow. I also found that the focus throw could be longer than the typical Leica lens, and while it's not impossible, I found it difficult to go from infinity to close focus in one go, and if you do so, it demands just the right style of grip, and it's not the most convenient. For the most part, my photography doesn't involve going from one extreme focus distance to the other, and when I use the 90mm Apo, I tend to rock between certain focus zones based on the subject matter. For example, 6 feet to about 15 feet for portraits, and then maybe 15 to 25 feet for street photography, or using hyperfocal distance for street and landscapes whenever I could. But I found that even with a properly aligned rangefinder and using these smaller zones of focus, this lens can be extremely unforgiving, especially when using it wide open on a traditional rangefinder. I think this is in part because the in-focus elements can be rendered with extreme clarity, and the out-of-focus areas can appear smooth and soft. So more so than other lenses, it can be very apparent when you missed focus even slightly with the 90mm Apo. So I really find myself stopping down significantly when using this lens on a traditional rangefinder camera, and while this does tend to improve image quality, it was less of an artistic choice and more of a necessity for me to use this lens practically for my work. And this kind of brings me to the reason why I wanted to make this video in the first place, and it goes beyond just the 90mm Apo and has a lot to do with perfection versus practicality and what a camera means today. I find this lens so interesting because although it was released over 20 years ago, I think you'd be forgiven for thinking it was designed yesterday, especially because it feels so much more at home with Leica's more modern lineup of cameras and lenses. Upon release, I think it was a highly specialized lens, but one that could be very powerful for the right user. I could definitely see the tighter focal length and faster aperture, but with high image quality and a quiet rangefinder system, being perfect for production stills on movie sets. And the same kind of goes for events and photojournalism. And I could also see the more true-to-life image with little to no chromatic aberrations being super beneficial for say print or enlarging color negatives as a fine art or portrait photographer when film might have been the only choice. For me, film is often a primary choice, but my workflow as a modern film photographer, especially when it comes to color stocks, is purely an analog to digital process where I scan my negatives before any kind of publication or printing is done, so I can take advantage of advancements in software, which in turn makes me much more open to compromising on perfection at the point of acquisition for a more practical kit. Basically, I'd rather get the shot, and in the case of a 90mm lens, I think it means compromising on optical perfection. Because even with a higher magnification camera, and even taking two cameras with me, I found the size and handling of this lens more often than not compromising my ability to take the photos I want to take on a traditional rangefinder camera. And I know that 90mm lenses are going to be bigger or at least longer than a 50 or 35mm lens, at some point it's just physics, and that comes with its own set of compromises. But I can also appreciate the work that Leica has done with a lens like this, designed under constraints that most manufacturers don't have to deal with. 
At the time of its release, the M mount was over 40 years old, and the Apo 90 is something I think no one could have dreamed up in 1954 upon the release of the M3, a camera that today is almost 70 years old. And Leica still continues to push the boundaries of what an M camera can do. But at the same time, I think it's fair to say that the functionality of an M camera has changed. And it's changed in a way that makes lenses like this much more practical for more people in more photographic scenarios. Ever since the M240, with its addition of live view, or the introduction of the new VisoFlex adapters, the meaning and way you can use a Leica M camera has fundamentally changed. Not to mention the SL, or all the mirrorless cameras that have come to market in just a few short years. It opens up a lot more use cases and possibilities with a lens like this. And so my criticisms of this lens are more for it as a traditional rangefinder lens. After all, in 1998, the only way that you could have used this lens was on a traditional rangefinder body, so that's how I choose to judge it, as a primarily film like a user. But on a mirrorless camera, the story is completely different. If you can take advantage of it, especially at f2, it'll probably perform better than anything else its size for many years to come, and feels much more at home with a mirrorless camera. But on a classic rangefinder, in my experience, it just gets far enough away from what made me fall in love with these cameras and what keeps me coming back time after time. Classic rangefinders are by no means perfect cameras, and you do have to compromise a lot when using one, but for those that are willing to compromise, I think they still uniquely offer a very high quality yet practical kit that gets out of the way and lets you get the shot when it counts. But it's also a nice little bonus that these traditional rangefinders can also defy physics just a little bit sometimes. Anyways. I'm David, and this is The Whole Picture.